That's bright. Wow. Yay, we're in the house of the Lord. Again, what an honor to be here with all of you this morning. Pastor Drew, the staff here that allows the deaf congregation and the Spanish congregation to be together in one family. That's amazing. Wow. It's really it's exciting for me, you know. Let's pray before we begin. Father in heaven, again, we come before you in your hallowed son's name. We commit to studying your word, not the word of Bill Gipple, but your word, God, as you impart to all your house. We look to you. We are expectant of you, Father. All of us, we look to you. And we thank you again, always, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm talking about the parable of the vineyard today. You know, the vineyard where the grapes of, are. And I'm starting in Mark 12, verse 1, and I will go through 12. Now, this story is talking about a man who planted the vineyard of grapes, and then he built a wall around it and dug a pit for pressing the grape juice or wine, and he built a lookout tower. And then he leased that vineyard to tenants, or what we would now call farmers. And then he moved to another country. Next slide, please. Perfect, thank you. Now, when it talks about the man, this is a picture of what the vineyard might look like, a big, big stone wall all around it, the watchtower in the middle, a place to press the grapes over here on the side. You know, and only certain people would have access, right? Other people would be blocked. And they had a large tower so they could look out over the wall and protect it, or if they saw a fire approaching or anything like that. And then here in the front corner, you see where they would press the grapes, you know, with their feet. I actually saw that done, you know, and someone pours more grapes in and they press them down. It was quite interesting. And it talks about the man who planted the vineyard. And I want us today to draw an analogy between that man and God our Father. And the vineyard is the people of Israel. Think about that, right? And the anointing that they had from God. The tenants or the farmers, they would have been the religious leaders of Israel back at that time. Or currently, any religious naysayers in the world, you know. You could kind of do an analogy, a comparison of the old story to our current world. Next slide, please. And then the story continues in two to four. When the grapes were ready, the, <clears throat> the man, the one who had built the vineyard, sent one of his servants to go and collect the money. But the farmers, they're like, nope. They grabbed him, they beat him, and they killed him. And then they sent him back empty-handed. The owner was like, hmm, what, what's going on here? Okay, let me send another guy. So he sent another servant. But again, they beat him, killed him. Still, the owner sent another one. And again, they were beaten or killed. So I want to compare those, servant, those servants that were going to be beaten and killed to present-day faithful prophets or missionaries of the world who oppress oppression all the time and face that, knowing that they're doing the work of the Father but could be killed or beaten for it. I think of a story, you know, that in the Bible sometimes people think it's only for the old day, but it's also for current day. You can draw the analogy if you think about it. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the owner was like, all my servants are being beaten or killed until there was only one left, his precious son, who he loved very much. And the owner said, I will send him. 
Maybe they will respect him. They certainly won't kill him. Right? But no. They took him in. They grabbed him. They were selfish, those vineyard people. And they indeed killed the son of the owner. testing that beloved son we would you know compare to Jesus the son of testing testing all right let me back up for my interpreter Dear God, help us. I don't want to be confused. All right. So again, the owner sent his precious son. And the farmers and the religious leaders, they didn't like him. They took him and killed him. Right? Now, does that story sound familiar to you? You know, missionaries face this type of abuse. Jesus came and faced this type of beating and death. It's a story that we see repeated over and over again, right? We're all, all, the Old Testament, the New Testament, us, we are all one body under Christ. And, you know, it talks in the Bible about martyrs, right? And how they get killed for the name of Jesus. But if we're looking to him and following his lead, that shouldn't matter. It happens today, maybe not as distinct as murder, but it definitely happens. And Jesus talks about, you know, what do you imagine? You know, when you think of that vineyard, what do you imagine? What do you see? Right? Can you imagine, here's someone leasing a vineyard and they send someone and he gets killed and then he sends someone else a second time and the Roman centurions you know in history we know that it was not an easy death they would take you and torture you And we know from the Bible stories that many people were tortured. We know from missionary stories that when they come back of the torture they've experienced. But they have God's blessing. And Jesus says, I told them. That if they had killed him, I would kill them, take their vineyard and give them to someone else. So who is that someone else? Can we have the next slide? Who is those other people that he gave them to? They're Christians. They're the new church. It's the new church of Christ. It's us. Right? You know, I know there have been false churches through the years. There have been heresy through the years. But the real church of Jesus has continued, regardless of torture, death, beating, killing. It continues. And Jesus, remember when he went into the temple and he got so upset that they were doing wicked work in the temple and the house of God, and he upturned the tables? I want us to think about that now. This is the house of the Lord. This is where we come to worship God. Right? And when he set up his new church, he said it will be so strong that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's what his word tells us. And that's the church we're in that's continued. And the gates of hell or this world will not prevail against it. It will continue. You know, and when we talk about the church of God, we're not talking about one ethnicity. 
We're talking about several ethnic groups. We're talking about languages all mixed together, diverse, under the name of God. That's this church. You know, back in Israel's time, they were mixed together too. You know that, right? And here we are, wonderful example. We have a Spanish speaker right now. We, or Hispanic, if I say it properly. We have Asians in our room. We have deaf in our room right here. And all those deaf are of deaf, different ethnicities. It's not just one ethnicity, even within the deaf church. We're all together. And the verses, the scriptures tell us that we're family. That's what the scriptures say, and they promise. Maybe you don't know. But in the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, in Isaiah 29, verse 18, it says, in that day, the deaf will hear or see, and the blind will see the word of God. In that day. Hmm, what day is that? That's what God's word tells us. And here we are together under OCFA, all together worshiping that same God together right now. He will come again, and it doesn't matter what group you're from, what ethnicity you're from, what part of the world you're from. We will live together forever and worship God. Amen. The scriptures go on to say, The interpreter made a little mistake. I apologize. We're going to back up a little bit. Can we change the slide? No, it's good. No, can we change the slide, please? There, there we are. That'll help my interpreter. So in verses 10 through 11, it says, didn't you ever read this in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And this is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. It's wonderful to see that growth and that building and that change. It's not our plan. It's not what we have. And that's what's beautiful about this church. We see it changing and growing and revival coming. And then in verse 12, we see... Now, let me back up a little bit. The Jewish people back then, they would look at Jesus and they would be like, uh-huh, uh, yeah, you're not really one of us right? The people loved Jesus. He was popular, right? Compare that today to the world leaders, right? What do they want? They want popularity rather than the truth. But he said he is returning to bring the truth to the world, whether the world accepts it or not, right? But the world will not be able to stop him. We're the believers, and we're going to be here until rapture. When that is, we don't know. But we're looking forward together as one family. Amen to you, right, for you hearing people. I want to thank you for your listening to my first part of the sermon. And now Pastor Adam is going to come up and finish us up in this chapter. Good morning, everyone. Well, it's an honor to, um, to be up here and continue with Pastor Bill. And this last weekend, I moved, my wife and I moved our daughter uh, to college. And she's, going, she's not far. She's at Vanguard University. But they, did, they don't prepare you for this. They really don't. In fact, uh, I was... Reading, uh, I was Googling stuff, uh, honey, and uh, the number one top parent advice on the first week after you drop off your child said this, give them space. Many parents will be tempted to check in on their child every hour or so for the first few days, and I found myself doing that, and Joe uh, Contreras, wherever you are, uh, I, I'm working on it. He saw me uh, the other day, and he said, okay, now go home, let her be. So uh, if you see my wife and I crying along the way, just we're, we're working through, through that, but we're excited and, and for her. As we continue with where Pastor Bill left off, 
just a review. On the outline of Mark 12, Jesus had recently come into Jerusalem. I want to set the stage for you um, where Pastor Bill started and back up for a moment because Jesus uh, had recently come into Jerusalem on a donkey and as the, the, as the world was getting ready to celebrate the Passover. And uh, th- this was the week of Jesus' crucifixion. And quickly, Jesus finds himself teaching in the temple. And that's where we started with the parable of the evil farmers with the vineyard and and where we see from there and we build. Because as you see, as David, as you continue with these slides, as you see here, Jesus is quite busy. (laughs) If you want to take a a snapshot or go back and read Mark chapter 12, uh, today we covered, we cover the first parable and Jesus, you see, is quite busy and he's, he's busy (laughs) with the religious leaders. And uh, we continue here this morning. I want to just touch on briefly uh, where he is talking with the Pharisee uh, in verse 28 uh, about the greatest commandment. I think that's one that we have we have familiar with. Um, But let's take a look at that. How do we and let me transition by saying, let me ask this. How do we treat uh, people in the world today? And as believers, as Christ followers, are we different As we wrestle with that question, are we bringing hope? Are we living a life of influence with our our peers, with our coworkers, students, with your classmates? Can they know, do they know that you're different students? Uh, With family, or can they barely tell us apart from the rest of the world? Jesus called us to be in the world, but not of it. And many have argued over this principle, but Christ simply calls believers to love others unconditionally to bring hope and to not compromise. So if God has called us to love, then why do we see or give mixed messages? We've seen signs uh, held up in the street still today that say things such as repent sinner or go to hell, or, or God hates, you fill in the blank. Uh, we, we see signs, AIDS, judgment, or cure, or Jesus is coming and boy is he mad. If you don't love God, go to hell. A sign that says turn or burn, God hates you. The the only global warning you must fear is when he returns. These are signs that I've seen. And I think about that for a moment. Maybe you've seen those before, but that would absolutely be a turnoff for me. Because that is contradictory of what we read in Scripture about who God is. And human beings uh, have brought confusion to the gospel and I believe have turned millions off. In fact, I would pose the question, who gave us the right to judge? Who, who made us the expert on others' salvation? You, you may not be the, the guy or the gal that's standing on the corner condemning society, but perhaps you found yourself more judgmental than you realize. And I know I have and have to step back over the years. So in verse 28, Mark records a teacher of the law asking Jesus which of all the commandments was the most important to follow. And I'd love to just read that as as you look here on the screens, and I'll read. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, and noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one answered Jesus is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. We read on here as the Pharisee is, is, is working through that. Well said, teacher. The man replies, you're right in saying that God is one and there's no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. This is a Pharisee responding, the teacher of the law. When Jesus, in verse 34, and when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God and from then no on no one dared ask him any more questions you know what i love about jesus every time he was encountered with a question jesus like flips it and throws a question right back at him and as you as you see oftentimes they're trying these the teachers of the law are trying to really catch jesus and 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 stir the pot up by by jesus's time the jews had accumulated hundreds of laws hundreds one historian records upwards of 613 laws that they had, they had worked through. And some religious leaders 
tried to distinguish between major, major laws and minor laws. Sometimes we found ourselves in society of even categorizing sin. And they're categorizing even with the minor laws and the major laws. And some taught that all laws were equally binding and that it was dangerous to make any distinctions. This teacher's question here could have provoked major controversy among these groups present. And Jesus knew that. But Jesus answers, summarizes all of God's law. So I want you to follow along with me, David, on the screens. But Jesus mentions two commandments. Briefly, let's hit on those. Let's, let's refresh ourselves there with Deuteronomy 6.5. Jesus touches on that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. He adds with your, with your mind. And then the other, in Leviticus 6.5, if you're taking notes, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Excuse me, that was Deuteronomy 6.5. Do not, and then he goes on with Leviticus 19.18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. But love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You know, interesting, both have to do with love. And, and I was reflecting on this. There are three words in the Bible often translated to love. Just a review for us. Uh, you can see Pastor Derek for a thorough review in class uh, on this. But the three often translated love, phileo, which is a friendship love. Eros, which is that romantic love. Um, so, so that friendship love is that brotherly, family love. That, that love that we have for our children. That love that I have for my daughter as I say goodbye with tears in my eyes. As you say goodbye to your kindergartner, by the way, when they're off to school for the first time, and, you're, and you have a hard time letting them go. We have a picture of my daughter Malia uh, in kindergarten starting her first day, and then we've got plenty of pictures now, now, by the way, as we let her go to Vanguard. But that brotherly love, phileo, friendship, eros, a romantic love, and then agape, God's perfect love, giving, selfless love. Which one do you see most in society, church? Well, often we see, often eros, the romantic love is what society fixates on when we talk about love. The world's perception of love is much different than what God intended love to be, by the way. Love is not earned and love does not give up on someone. Love is not a feeling in this context where where we're headed and it shouldn't be abused. The word love is abused greatly in the world we live in. But God's love is is perfect. God's love is eternal, forgiving, compassionate, merciful, gracious. Oftentimes, love can hurt. As children, remember when we were disciplined or corrected out of love? So that we wouldn't touch that hot stove again? Or perhaps hit our sister over the head with a bat? Or create that Crayola masterpiece of a lifetime all over the bedroom walls? We could go on, but in this context, why is love so important? Jesus said that all of the commandments were given for two simple reasons, to help us love God and to help us love others. God's laws are not burdensome. They're not. Here they reduce to two simple principles, love God, love others. It's that simple, but we have complicated things both come from the old testament when we love god completely and we care for others as we care for ourselves and we fulfill the intent of the ten commandments and the other old testament laws according to jesus these two commandments summarize all of god's laws may they rule your thoughts your decisions and your actions. When you are uncertain about what to do, ask yourself which course of action best demonstrates the love for God and the love for others. I was reminded of this while driving home with my lovely bride of 19 years after spending a beautiful weekend together. We saw a few shows and hiked through the Red Rock Canyons outside of Las Vegas. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's beautiful. I preferred that over the Strip. I don't know if you've ever uh, found yourself driving home from Las Vegas on a Sunday or at the end of a weekend. What was a four-hour drive turns into over a six-hour drive. 
and I would find myself frustrated with, especially when the lanes would go to two and the cars that would weave in and out, weave in and out, weave in and out, right? And I started to sound like my father when I'm like, oh, this car's going to start an accident. And my wife would look over me, <laughs> you okay? More than, more than one time where I finally pulled over after quite some time and <laughs> to allow my wife to finish the drive while I refocused on loving those around me. But it's hard. So which is the greatest teacher as they talk with Jesus? And he says, it's simple. Love God. Love others. Simply stop carrying church. May we stop carrying the burden of the attempt to fix everything around us. And simply love. Love those around us, even those that may be acting an absolute fool. Even those that you've taken it upon yourself to believe that they just don't deserve it. Well, friends, the news for us all is that neither do we. But God calls us to love. To love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to love our neighbor. Jesus had a lot to say about love in his ministry. Let's just give you a glimpse. If you're taking notes, that's a lot. I'm not going to hit on all of that. If you want to take a screenshot with your smartphones, Jesus had a lot to say about love in his ministry as I was walking through this. From God, God loves us as that reminder to we are to love God. Because, love, because God loves us, he cares for us. There's a second slide as well, David. So as they take a picture of that slide, move over to the next one. Jesus has a lot to say about love. What's that next one? There's even more. Oh, we already, we already did that. We had that. So, so what is love? The Pharisee, before we get there, hold on, had caught the intent of God's love. Love. The true obedience comes from the heart. Because of all the Old Testament commands, they all lead to Christ. His next step was faith in Jesus Christ. Pharisee. This was and is the most difficult step to take, especially for this teacher of the law. We don't know if this Pharisee ever became a true believer. But what, what can we take away in this moment? Being close, being close, being close to being a follower of Christ is extremely off if a person never commits and ask Jesus Christ to be Lord of their life. And salvation cannot rest on an intellectual knowledge alone. We can debate with others and be right all we want. But if love isn't exemplified and action doesn't follow, then the mark's been missed. Love God. Love others. And, and there must be true repentance, hear me, church, that leads to following Christ and being made through the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot be content with being close. Th th there are too many close, lukewarm uh, Christians around. We cannot be a follower of Christ simply by association. This is the greatest commandment. Love God. Love others. You cannot follow that commandment if the step is not taken and the commitment not made. And that's why here at Orange County First Assembly, we take that so serious every week. Pastor, please give the church, pastor says to us, give the church an opportunity to respond to ask Jesus Christ as Lord of their life. So as I conclude this morning and the band comes up, what is love? I mean, every time I hear that song, I think of that song, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me, right? Well, this is the world is saying, baby, don't hurt me. What is love? See, the world's got it all, all wrong. And here the teacher talks with Jesus. And says, What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus, well... Let's talk about that. We complicate things so much, I believe, as, as believers. 
What if we were just to stop trying to, we get so caught up and tangled up in all the things that are going on around us when, when God's called us to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love him with everything we have. And in doing that, may we truly love others. Love is what God is. Love is why Christ came. Love is why he continues to come into our lives and seek to captivate our hearts. The greatest love of all is God's love for us, a love that showed itself in action for you and I. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 reminds us, church, but God demonstrates his own love for us. In this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you. He died for myself. You know, Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa was, she dedicated her life to care for the destitute and the dying in the slums of Calcutta. I had an opportunity, a dear friend, missionary, one, you know, Tom Bonnard, took a team to India and we served in the home of the destitute and dying in Calcutta, something that Mother Teresa had founded. She says those words. I found the paradox that if you love until it hurts, there can be no hurt. Only more love. Those are some good words dedicated her life to love God's children. Through receiving this gift of love, we find healing, we find restoration, we find hope and a second chance. Love, church, is an eternal gift that lasts forever. God's love is perfect. So we close this morning. We unpacked a lot this morning from our children blessing us with a beautiful baby that we dedicated to the Lord. We celebrate that and we'll stand with your child as you raise her up as God calls her to greatness. Will you receive that love today? May you be at peace this morning, receiving his love, his mercy, his grace. Perhaps today God is calling you to forgive those that have hurt you. Bitterness, rage, and anger, that, that unforgiveness in our hearts can really, it imprisons us the most, holds us back. Maybe for some this morning, in a moment, our prayer partners are going to come forward and pray with you. Maybe for some, God is speaking as he's calling us to love him. First and foremost, we, we, we if anything else, as, as this world is just throwing stuff at us all around us, may we stop with the titles, may we stop with all the things that the world comes out with us, and may we just reflect and be reminded that I am a son or daughter of the Most High. And our first resp responsibility is to sit in that peace of knowing that we are a child of God and we've been called to love him. And through that, he called us to love others. So maybe God is stirring in your heart that. Perhaps he's drawing you near and calling you close the door on your past for you to close the door on your past and begin to take the steps necessary to walk in restoration hope forgiveness finding healing maybe it's in a relationship maybe it's with your body we believe that god heals today physically so as we transition we're gonna sing a beautiful song in just a moment. I want to give you an opportunity to reflect as we close. 
but I also want us to give an opportunity to, to meet Jesus. And this morning, may we be reminded that the simplicity of the greatest commandment of all is to love him, to love others. But before we do that, with all heads bowed and eyes closed, or those that that are here this morning, they would love to give their life. Maybe you're not in a place, in your place where you want to get right with the Lord. I'd love to give you that opportunity right now to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. The best decision that you'll ever make. If we confess with our mouth, believe in our heart that He is Lord, the Bible says we will be saved. If you'd like to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life, This morning, we want to pray with you. Would you just simply slip up your hand with me as a sign that you're saying, I believe with me. Yes, I believe. I believe. I choose to follow Christ and make him Lord of my life. Yes. Yes. Any other hands? Amen. Amen. I see those hands all over the place. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray with you. I want you to repeat the church, the body of Christ. Pray, let's pray together as we invite Jesus into our hearts and into our lives, making him Lord and Savior. And as we do that, the worship team is going to transition and we're going to worship and the prayer partners are going to come forward. And I want you, if you also raise your hand, I want you to come and pray with one of our prayer partners as well. And tell them, hey, I just invited Jesus Christ into my heart. Let them pray with you and encourage you. But also those other things that we talked about, Maybe the Lord is stirring in your heart what it truly means to love others and to love God. So before we go there, let's pray together. Let's invite Jesus. For those that raise their hand, I want to pray with you in the whole church. And for those that are watching online, would you pray with me? Father, this morning I dedicate my life to you. Would you repeat those words? I choose to follow you. I accept you into my life this morning. I ask you to forgive me from all of my sins. Come into my heart. Change me from the inside out. Today I choose to follow you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. As our prayer partners come forward, we celebrate with those that have that asked Jesus Christ into their heart this morning. Amen. As our prayer partners come forward, as our band leads us, we're going to sing, I Speak Jesus. And if this is a new song for you, I just want you to reflect on those words as we celebrate, as we worship, making Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of our lives. If you said that prayer this morning, I want to invite you to come forward. Let our prayer partners pray with you this morning. If you have bitterness or anger, or the Lord is putting something in your heart that you want to release this morning. I feel that the Lord is saying to release that this morning in the mighty name of Jesus and allow God to bring healing and restoration and break those bondages. If you need healing in your body this morning, we invite you to come forward so our prayer partners can pray with you. And church body, would you stand with us as we sing this song together? Hello, my name is Pastor Sabrina. And I'm Pastor Stephen. And we're the youth pastors here at OCFA. Thank you guys for joining us for Church Online. We're so grateful that you were able to tune in. If you gave your life to Jesus, or if you want to learn more about our church, go ahead and visit our website, ocfirstag.com. If you like social media, follow us on Instagram or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you guys again, and we'll see you next week. God bless.